Malaysian armor personnel carriers, I can't, I can't compliment these guys enough. We needed more guns, so we took the cooks and the supply clerks and everybody else and we put them on five ton and deuce and a half vehicles, two and a half ton vehicles behind us and rolled out into the city streets with just as many guns as we could. We drove down a, a little a narrow road getting close to the Durant crash site and my vehicle came under an intense ambush. Um, in the process, we were hit by rocket propelled grenades and gunfire and I backed out of the ambush. And, we started to drive our way around the city, and as we were driving around the city to come into the crash site from the back side of the city, uh, we linked up with a bunch of other rangers from the Humvees that were trying to make their way back to the base. But quite frankly, the vehicles were so shot up that they couldn't even move anymore. They were being pushed by some of the large trucks. So we stopped what we were doing, grabbed all of the dead and the wounded off of those vehicles, put them on our Humvees, drove them back to the base, got more fuel, got more ammunition, got ready to go back out to get to the Durant crash site. But at this point, our commander, the task force commander, Major General William Garrison realized, we can't keep putting these Humvees in the city streets. They're getting shot to pieces. And these are the light-skinned Humvees. They didn't have armor back in those days. So we asked the United Nations if they would help us. And the United Nations, a uh, couple of countries from the United Nations showed up with armor and uh, tanks. The Malaysians came with their armored personnel carriers and the Pakistanis came with a couple of tanks and they met us all at our base at about 11 o'clock that night. We all drove back out there together. Me and my men stayed on the same Humvees Three of the four tires shot flat underneath us and stayed there until nine o'clock the next morning, fighting back and forth and losing men all night long until the rest of the guys that were out there in the city streets could, could get on those vehicles and we can drive them back out of the city streets. We became the bullet magnets. If, if you wanted to kill Americans, come to the, to the streets where all of the Humvees are and shoot at the Humvees, which is basically what happened all night long. The Malaysian armor personnel carriers, I can't, I can't compliment these guys enough for their courage. They basically kept a driver and a gunner in those vehicles and then handed the rest of it over to us and said, we'll, we'll go wherever you ask us to go. We'll do whatever you ask us to do tonight. We're here to help out. The Pakistanis in their tanks, not so much. They rolled in there, got shot at a time or two and rolled right back out of there and left the Humvees and these Malaysian APCs in the city streets. Um, so we had so many dead and wounded from our task force that we couldn't put them inside these armor personnel carriers. Big white vehicles with giant UN letters painted on them because they were doing a UN mission. And what we ended up doing is putting the guys that were wounded inside the armor personnel carriers, putting the dead bodies on top and uh, just letting them hang off of the top of the Humvee or those APCs, armor personnel carriers, which means the blood is just running down the sides of these white armor personnel carriers. And we really stayed there basically until everybody that was killed at the crash site, all of the bodies of the pilots and the crew from those helicopters could be recovered. Yeah, one of the things that was really a challenge for us is range, the, 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 the task force ranger. Now, it wasn't just rangers. It was other special operators from the Air Force and from the Navy and other special operators from the U.S. Army over there in the city streets together. And we didn't have the full array of the military capability with us. So we didn't have close air support and we didn't have naval gunfire and we didn't have jets and uh, artillery to bail us out. We didn't even have American... Uh, tanks, though we repeatedly asked for them, we had to. A we had when we got in trouble that night. We had to ask the United Nations to come help out, which they did. And again, I can't think enough. The and screams of the Malaysian drivers to get them out of here. Back at headquarters, General Garrison, realizing that the QRF Humvees won't be enough to rescue his troops, has called on the UN peacekeeping force of Pakistanis and Malaysians at the Newport area in the south of the city for aid. Not a quick reaction force, and having not been given warning of the raid, it is taking a few hours for the rescue column, armed with 4 M48 tanks and 32 Condor armoured personnel carriers, to mobilise for the rescue mission into the city. 10th Mountain QRF and Task Force Ranger Humvees arrive at the Newport Zone at around 10pm, 
and so begins a frustrating 90 minutes of planning and organisation. The rescue force finally departs the Newport area at 11.23pm and heads north into the city. American 10th Mountain Division troops, TFR and Malaysian troops have transferred onto the Malaysian APCs, crewed with Malaysian drivers and gunners. US 10th Mountain troops had initially expressed concern about the competence of their Malaysian counterparts, and that they should just hand over their armoured personnel carriers to the Americans. But given the day's events, voicing this to them may not have been particularly well received, and no such concerns were raised. The Pakistani tanks lead the column of 70 vehicles to National Street, where the Malaysian condors will then spearhead the force into the city. The majority of the convoy will hold between the two crash sites, and elements will move to both sites to carry out the rescues. For the most part, only the officers speak English, so organising the route, radio comms and rules of engagement has taken time. 10th Mountain AH-1 Cobras are now arriving on station to provide a much needed relief for the Little Birds providing relentless air support to the ground forces. Maneuvering the armoured vehicles through the thin streets and alleyways isn't a good idea, so the convoy remains on the major roads as it navigates into the city. Their journey in is slowed by heavy fighting. While the APCs have some armour, the Humvees don't. RPGs flash towards them, and a rocket bounces off the hood of one Humvee. One of the transport trucks takes a disabling RPG hit, and the men on board scramble into nearby vehicles. Malaysian gunners pound nearby buildings with cannon fire to cover their movements. Despite the use of armour, the battle in is tough and slow for the two mile long convoy. A Malaysian soldier is killed when an RPG hits the lead condor. Seven more Malaysians and two Pakistanis are wounded during the fight into the city. The RPG hits and casualties cause further delay to the convoy. The Rangers and Delta besieged at Crash Site 1 continually radio in to the C2 bird, asking when the convoy will arrive. 40 minutes, they say. Then, 30 minutes later, another 40 minutes. Then 10 minutes, then 20 minutes, then simply soon. The men on the ground have no choice but to laugh at the erratic time estimates. With a healthy dose of eye-rolling, any minute now becomes the standard response when the question is asked. The convoy arrives at its central assembly point on National Street, and halts amid a continuing firefight. The vehicles of the leading half of the convoy take a right turn up Hordig Road, and approach a roadblock just south of the target building that Rangers and Delta Force had landed on nine hours earlier. Again fearing bombs and mines planted inside the roadblock, the Condors can't simply drive through. Tenth Mountain troops dismount from the lead vehicles, some progressing on foot towards the first crash site, others dismantling the roadblock by hand. The convoy and dismounted soldiers fight block by block through the city, in a constant battle with the SNA militia. 23-year-old Tenth Mountain Private James Martin is killed as he moves through the city on foot. To the south, rescue forces arrive at Mike Durant's crash site too, but the crew are nowhere to be found. The Somali mob has carried the bodies of the dead crew members away, and Durant himself is under the captivity of Ideed. The ground forces secure sensitive material on board and prepare explosive charges to destroy the helicopter. With the roadblock clear, the convoy rolls eastward with dismounted troops alongside on the street. Ten and a half hours after the first TFR boots landed in downtown Mogadishu, their rescue column has arrived. The Humvees and Condors reinforce the Ranger perimeter and quickly get to work helping to free Walcott's body from the downed chopper. The Americans and Malaysians continue to hold off the city, with RPG rounds and vehicle-mounted heavy machine guns still battering them from all around. Wounded Sergeant Goodell in one of the Condors loses his cool and screams at the Malaysian drivers to get them out of here. No, no, we stay, comes the response in broken English, and the rescue force holds the line. An RPG ricochets off another Condor, and again the driver calms and reassures his American counterparts. With the sun rising, and after countless hours of effort under fire, the crew of Super 6-1 is rescued from the downed Blackhawk. At 5.45am, the cover of darkness no longer offers its protective blanket, and the vehicles finally begin to roll south to rejoin the others, holding on National Street and Hallwardig Road. There's a big problem, however. With the vehicles carrying dead and wounded on stretchers, there isn't enough room for all of the rangers and delta operators. They have no choice but to run the mile south to National Street on foot. The Humvees and Condors don't drive slowly enough for the men on the ground to use them as cover, and they find themselves alone. Finally, 
The exhausted men spot the column of APCs and Humvees waiting for them. Each now running on nothing but adrenaline, they collapse into the vehicles. The lone dash by the Rangers and D-Boys back to the convoy would become known as the Mogadishu Mile. With Pakistani tank support and with Pakistani troops dismounting to clear roadblocks, the convoy finally rolls out towards the Pakistani Military Health Stadium northeast of them at 6.20am. In the disastrous Battle of Mogadishu, one Malaysian, one Pakistani and 19 Americans have been killed or will die in hospital of their wounds, with a further 82 UN troops wounded.